Yeah, I mean, the Holy Family, this is my amateur gym, uh, where I spent most of my most of my amateur days, well, all my amateur days here, growing up, I was in here from, well, competition back then, starting at 11. So you're boxing from 11, but I would have been in here from about the age of nine. Sort of uh, learning the rope before turning sort of into 11 year old where I could actually box. Did you start a really little competition? Like yeah, I mean, my brother boxed, Sean boxed, and which basically uh, that was my way into it. I mean, I was in the Scouts. Right. And uh, we went to Drogheda every year. I was our big out in, in, in the scouts. We used to go to Drogheda down to see Oliver Plunkett's head. And uh, Sean joined the boxing club. And within two weeks, he was going to Dublin. And I joined the club the next week to try and get to Dublin. Right. The rest is history. So, you're so a couple of years older than me? Yeah, Sean's two years older than me. So, uh, he would have been sort of the big brother then. Because I suppose back then, two years when you're a kid's a big lot, you know. So, you'd have been looking up to that and sort of following that. Yeah. What year would that have been? Now you're asking. Uh, it would have been about about seventy one. Right. I would have jumped, but I would have, would have been my first sort of. Uh, but in the seventies, I would have joined. And then started the box sort of seventy one, seventy two as a juvenile. And would this be very slow then? Well, well, no, it wasn't always here. It was based back then in the, on the New Lodge Road, beside right. Patrick Wells Snooker Club. You you went up an alley when it split. Right hand side was the snooker club. Left hand side was the boxing. You know, so that's why you probably find out most of the boys come out of Holy Family are good snooker players, you know. Uh, of my age anyway. <laughs> I've seen you in action too. So, uh, no, I mean, and then the club moved around to here. This used to be a big army. Uh, because of where we are, Victoria Barracks is what, what's called no, that's like, and It used to be a, a real army barracks, and this would have been a, a train hall for the army. But, uh, it's way before the troubles even, you know, but uh, it was a run the base that was no longer used. And then it was taken over by the community, and uh, it's now a community club with the upstairs that we're sitting in now, which is our club. Right, right. So it would have been a bit of a, bit of a change anyway, yeah? Fuck yeah, I mean, I mean, you're talking about the 70s, you know, 70s, I mean, a lot, lot happening in Belfast, you know, a lot happening on New Lodge Road. The New Lodge Road was a very busy road, a lot of trouble came through the New Lodge Road. So uh, to have something as strong as a, a strong boxing club to keep kids doing what they were doing, probably. I mean, you were, I was one of the kids, so you didn't really know, but to, to have somewhere to go that you didn't really understand was keeping you off the streets. Probably kept uh, more people out of jail than what we'll ever know. I uh, suppose, you know, and then just the fact they're in here when everything's happening. Yeah, uh, it's funny, you come round, you go round, you look at the, the walls and all the stuff that's on the walls. I uh, just was flicking over in the wall there. There's a, we actually boxed the paratroopers in this very hall back in the 70s. Uh, the paratroop army boxing team boxed the Holy Family and we beat them 10 now. <laughs> so it's a, it is documented and it is on the wall. So uh, it's one thing that I think they hold very pride. A lot of, a lot of There's a lot of bragging rights over that one. So I'd say so, I'd say so. I suppose it's better to beat them in here than out there. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, back then I suppose it wasn't as bad, you know, but uh, it would have been the time when they would have been talking together. But they had a uh, very strong, which they thought a very strong boxing team, uh, was the paratroopers. And uh, we were just a, a we club on the new lodge that happened to be at the right place at the right time and they came in they fought us it was open it was open the press here and it was all open like the people but everyone got beat suddenly got heavily beat like yeah like Patsy Lee beat two people on the same night I think he boxed two of them on the one night and not two of them you know but uh, there's there's things over there on the wall there's clippings on the wall you can read them brilliant brilliant you would have been in here then and this would have took you all the way through to your, your amateur career then yeah, I was very fortunate. I mean, I, I, I won the first Irish title when I was 11, at the first time of asking, uh, and was also very lucky to be voted the best boxer in Ireland when I was 11 years of age at four stone, which was the youngest and the lightest ever to get it. And I mean, my, my career sort of was blessed all the way through. I mean, I was Irish champion and fought in Irish championships right up till I retired and was Irish champion and probably uh, number one pick for the flyweight slot for Ireland till, till I turned pro. So, I mean, it, it was a sport that people say it's very hard, it is, but it, it's also, no matter how hard it is, it's always a wee bit easier if you're maybe knocking about the number one slot because you're getting all the all the good shots and all the good jobs. And did you start travelling away with the Irish team very early? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the one thing that it was sort of a bit sort of uh, I could never do, I never won an, an Ulster Junior title, uh, I won all the rest of the titles. Uh, I wasn't allowed to box in the Ulster Juniors. It used to be back then. They would have said the you won the five titles. That that was amazing. It was the county anthems, the Ulster Juniors, the Ulster Seniors, the Irish Juniors, and the Irish Seniors. Uh, but 
I when I after I come to the juvenile I boxed international for Ireland at seventeen, uh, like full international, right. so that they wouldn't let me box in the Ulster Juniors because it says I was a senior boxer. So I never won that one, but I, I was fortunate enough to win all the rest of the time. And what, what, when did you start then sort of traveling abroad with the Ireland? Uh, 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 well, as I say, seventeen. I would have been international. My first international would have been in, in Scotland. Funny enough, it was Ireland versus Scotland. It was my first one. And then I was fortunate enough to, to represent Ireland at two European Championships and the Olympic Games and numerous places have been been fortunate enough to fight in all the big arenas. I mean, uh, I've fought in Las Vegas, I've fought in Madison Square Gardens, uh, I've fought uh, Rio, Nevada, I mean Lake Tahoe, all around the States and uh, uh, just travelled the world. I mean, this is a wee lot coming from the New Lodge Road. I mean, that just wouldn't happen if it wouldn't have been for boxing. Yeah. So what was the Europeans, or did you Two Europeans, boxing Europeans in Germany. First Europeans were in Germany, and the second Europeans uh, boxed in was in Sweden. And so they were sort of before the Olympics, and then after that I went to Moscow for the Olympics. I suppose you wouldn't have seen them places had you not oh, no. Well, I mean, well, uh, Moscow, I mean, when I went to Moscow, Moscow was USSR. Like, it's, I know it's... Uh, Back then it was sort of closed, I mean now it's broken up, you have all the Russian states that are broken up. Back then it was a very closed sort of uh, place and uh, <coughs> getting into Russia wouldn't have been easy. Uh, till the extent that we were told that uh, when you went to Russia we were expecting to see sort of uh, all these big hard looking women and hard looking men. But some of the nicest people we ever met in our lives on, on my trips was in Russia, you know, and, uh, but I mean, it has nice memories for me. The Olympics, as I always said, was uh, probably one of the biggest things, biggest successes I've ever done in my life. And I was our, our fifth medalist to come back with the medal. What year was the most worth? Yeah. 1980, it's a it sounds like a hundred years ago. Uh, 1980 uh, was uh, the Olympics in, in Moscow. And there again, I mean, it, it, it always throws up. I always talk about the Olympics and it, every Olympics that you watch from that, you, you, the memories flood back. I mean, all the stuff that sort of people wouldn't really understand. Uh, stuff like, I mean, when you go to the Olympics, uh, you go to the Olympic Village, and I always describe the Olympic Village as being sort of, it's like heaven. You know, you're walking about in a, 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 a place that everybody's fit, everybody's healthy, everybody's on top of their game. These are the best athletes in the world. So everybody's big and they're looking good and ready to go and uh, everything's free, you don't buy anything. You know, you have accreditation around your neck which lets you eat free. You're in the village, everything's in the village from cinemas to everything that you need. And the funny bit about it was the canteen. The canteen always stuck in my mind because you were trying to cater for every athlete in the world from all over. So there were chefs from all over the world cooking all sorts of different food. Now, it sounds great, but I mean, back then you would be doing weight for the boxes. You would have been very careful what you eat and, and the coaches would have been very tight on you. But I always remember when you were sitting in the in the restaurants during lunchtime or when you were getting your food, there was always somebody singing happy birthday in some language. Because there's that many people there. It was somebody's birthday most days, you know, and you would have heard happy birthday getting someone. It was always very funny. But you make up friendships that uh, stay with you your whole life. So, you want a bronze at that Bronze, bronze yeah. at that, yeah. And what was the hardest bit? Was it getting there or, or getting there? Or? <coughs> back then, back then, it's it, the way the, the sport has changed. Now boxing has changed. Now you qualify for for the for a spot in the Olympics. And that's all to do with time. It's all to do with the time period because the Olympics has run over say ten days, and the rules have changed. It used to be when I fought, I, I think the rule was then that you were only allowed to box once in twenty four hours. But what they did was there's two sessions. So there's a morning session that starts at ten o'clock. And then there's the evening session starts at seven o'clock. So you were allowed to box once every every 24 hours. So if you boxed in the morning, uh, you were allowed to box the next day in the evening because you had went over the 24 hours. Now they changed the rules, and it's 48 hours. But to get the the number of bouts over within the time, they have to take the number of boxers down. There would be more boxers at the Olympics when I would have been boxed at them. I mean, I won I had five fights and got a bronze. I mean, if you have five fights now, you get a gold medal. Mm. But I mean, that's uh, that's neither here nor there, you know, it's just uh, it's the kind of place that you have to turn up for a fortnight every four years and be the best. And it always throws up some superstar. Yeah. I suppose like recently you've had Paddy Barnes and Michael Conlon and Yeah, I mean Paddy Barnes, Michael Conlon, Paddy Barnes both out of out of this club too. We're the only club in Ireland 
to have two Olympic medalists. Mm. You know, so uh, which is amazing for North Belfast. Like. And Barney Gia, or Barney, as we would call it, the school. They're the only school in Ireland to have two Olympic medalists too. So I mean, there's a uh, boxing's done done a lot for North Belfast, you know, on a very positive side. And how long was it then that you turned pro after? Uh, turned pro about eighty one, just the end of eighty one, eighty two. Turned pro, uh, signed with Barney Eastwood, and uh, it was it was grand. I mean, really, realistically, I'd, I'd done everything that I thought I possibly could do. I'd been to the Olympics and got a medal. I'd been to the Commonwealth Games and got a medal. Uh, Europeans had done twice, uh, so there was nothing really. There was no character for me, yeah. you know. So I needed something to to just to go for to see what I could do. So I turned pro. It was probably a great era, you know. It was an era where professional boxing in Belfast in the in the eighties was uh, there was no professional boxing here, and it was a good era. I mean, myself and McGuigan. McGuigan had turned pro about six months before me, and sort of. Him and Eastwood had got the uh, the ball rolling, and then I was approached by Barney Eastwood, but I would have signed with him and said yes, because basically, not for anything else, but purely because uh, there was nothing else to win as an amateur. So I said yeah, and I was fortunate enough for me. We were fighting back then as a pro. We were fighting then every four weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, within within the year, I fought for my first British title. I mean, I was you turned professional then. Where did you train out of Belfast then? Yeah, I mean, I was based in Belfast and. Uh, Box turned pro with Barney Eastwood, and uh, I mean Eastwood back then just just set up a gym. He just built the gym in Castle Street, and that's where we were based. Uh, I turned pro, and Barney McGuigan had already signed with Eastwood, so he was pro maybe about six to nine months before me. Uh, so when I, when I turned pro, sort of the the bandwagon had already started to roll, so it was a matter of jumping on it. And, uh, when I was approached by Eastwood uh, to go pro. Back then there, there was nobody really else in Belfast or Ireland that was promoting so uh, if you had a, wanted to turn pro you probably would have had to go to England and be based in England. So it, uh, it ticked a whole lot of boxes for me because I would have preferred to stay home and uh, I mean I had a great working relationship with Barney Eastwood the whole career my, my career. Was no real temptation then to, to jump over the water or not? No, no not really. I mean uh, I think we were very fortunate that, I mean, back then, Eastwood had, in the 80s, probably the best boxing stable in Europe. I mean, you take the fighters, I mean, the champions, I mean, in that year, funny enough, I would have been his first champion. I would have won a British title before McGuigan, even though McGuigan was pro nine months before me. I, I, I won I won the, uh, the British Bantamian title in December. And the funny thing about that was that was the last ever 15 round fight. British round, British title fight for 15 rounds. Uh, the rules had changed. I, I boxed uh, John Feeney and the fight was postponed. And Feeney got hurt and the fight was called off for two months. And then that time, the rules had changed the boxing down to 12 rounds. And when we got into the ring on the night, there was a whole controversy should it be 12 rounds or should it be 15? But because the contracts back then were signed at 15, it went ahead at 15. So that's why it was the last ever 15 rounder. Right, right. It's probably some real wars too, like daily armour and stuff. And yeah, some, some battles that people still talk about, you know. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's not it's not a pretty game. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a business at that level, you know, and you're, you're there to do as much as you can, you know, and uh, I mean, you meet so many nice people. I mean, it, it, it is, it's a hard sport and anybody, you can't gloss that up. I mean, I'm still involved in boxing, you know, I'm still involved in the, in the, the side of it where you try and look after fighters on the professional side of it, on boards. And uh, the thing that people can't forget is they're, they're human beings first, you know, and they need to be looked after. And the, uh, the honesty of it, I think, is, is the big thing. I mean, it's the only sport that comes in, comes in for a lot of abuse, but it's the only sport that openly goes out to hit anybody. You know, we're the only sport that goes out uh, physically to hit the other person. And it happens in a whole lot of sports. Uh, but uh, it always raises its head after someone gets hurt. Mm. And um, you were saying you had the best stable in Europe at that time yeah. in yeah. in Belfast. When you take places? you take the champions that came out of it, you know, well, obviously it was McGuigan, there was myself, there was Dave McCauley, there was Hoko Hutchison, there was Crisanto Espana. I mean, they just roll off your tongue. These are all great world. They all went on to win world titles. Yeah. You know, and this is back in the day when I hate to say, when there wasn't that many world titles about. You know, when I retired, 
there was only the WBA and the WBC. Uh, I mean, I, I wasn't around at the time when he had all the, the other titles, the IBO and the WBF and the, all the big bits of belt that sort of uh, back then the wouldn't have been as exciting as what people uh, think of them now, you know. But it's down to television. I mean, television want to see two guys fighting for something and they'll put something around their waist. I mean, the public just want to see the best two guys in the world fighting and sometimes it's harder to get them into the ring. Mm. You know, to actually fight than what it is anything else. You know, getting them there to fight is a hard thing. You were nice in the news about like Chris Anto Aswani and things like it. It's just amazing to think that people in the 80s came to Belfast this year. Oh yeah, I mean, back then the gym would have been renowned. I mean, obviously, I I would just be stepping down. I've been retired and I retired very early. And uh, But I mean, I mean, Dave McCauley went on to fight for the IBF world title. Uh, McGuigan went on for, for the WBA world title uh, and you guys flying and the thing about Barney Eastwood is Barney Eastwood uh, when we were boxing sort of running as professional stable and this had never happened before to my knowledge anyway he would have flew sparring partners in for you all the stuff that you hear about happening in the States it was happening here you know so I suppose he was big enough and uh, had a, a good backing behind him was able to do that you know and uh, it was probably the, the prime time for boxing yeah, it's just, just weird to think about what was going on through in Belfast. Oh yeah, but Castle Street, I mean, you, we all know Castle Street, nothing against Castle Street, but it was a wee drop of doorway you walked up and you, you could have had maybe four of the best fighters in the world training side by side. Yeah. You know, uh, if, they were, if you were putting prices on them like footballers, you would have a lot of money walking about the canvas, you know. Yeah. Amazing. And there again, the people they got the they got to know the people, and they walked about Belfast, and everybody got to know them, and they they were very well supported. Uh, so it just they coming from Panama to Belfast is it's big big ask. You think of the fighters that that came out of Panama, like like a Roberto Durans and people like that. There, I mean, to come to Belfast and to give it that credibility, yeah. must be amazing. And then you said you retired very early. And mm-hmm. I suppose you were known as much in your Afterlife. Okay. Afterlife. I, I I retired. I mean, I'll be quite truthful. I, re- I retired uh, after I'd won the Lonsdale belt. Uh, became the, the second Irish person ever to win a Lonsdale belt. The only one before me was Freddie Gulroy, and uh, it was probably the trophy that uh, most fighters will tell you. Out of all the trophies, all the world titles, uh, the big thing that they would all certainly British based fighters would all love to win a Lonsdale belt. Uh, I'd be biased, and I would say it's probably the nicest belt of them all. Uh, it's certainly probably the most expensive belt of them all because they're, they're worth a lot of money. Uh, and I was very fortunate to win mine outright. And then after that, I mean, after it done that, I mean, as I say, there was no sign of uh, the world champion back then was a Mexican. And uh, he never boxed out of Mexico. He always boxed in Mexico. And I, I was probably truthful enough for myself for have beaten him. Probably not. Probably not. And you have to be honest. You have to be honest with yourself. And that was probably the biggest uh, decision that I made. Uh, I probably wouldn't have beaten him. I wasn't going to go to Mexico and get beat up. So uh, I retired and I retired undefeated. So I was still champion. So there were still big fights out there for me. And I remember walking into Barney Eastwood into the office in Castle Street up to see the bosses, the way you want to be called, rung the bell, what I let you in, up the stairs and walked in. I says, I think that's me. I think I'm going to finish. I think I've done what I can do. He says, What? He says, You finish? You sure? What makes you? And he says, I, I, We sat down and had a talk. And he just says, well, that's what you want. He started up, shook my hand. He said, and I says, we'll bring mates for this, from then still. Yeah. Still very strong mates. And then how did you handle the talent then, uh, even though it was your own season then? And that, did you, did you already know what you were going to do? <coughs> well, I mean, I'd been dipping in, dipping out. Uh, I mean, the way things happened me, I was fortunate enough to buy my first camera at the Olympics. You know, so the way things just fall into place. After uh, I'd done well at the Olympics, I had to say that people were interested in you and you got a bit of media profile. So uh, I made friends, and I made friends with Brian Murphy. And Brian uh, got me in and took me under his wing, basically, uh, for a year in the Irish News for training. And it was sort of running, not not dovetailing, it was sort of, I was there when I wasn't training, uh, but it come up to fights I couldn't. And then, uh, I think Brian was always of the idea that you could never fight forever, like. Mm. You know, there's a time when you, and I suppose, thinking back, it was probably the, the bravest decision that I ever made to walk away, uh, and probably the best decision that I ever made, because uh, it's surprising you're always remembered for how you 
finish your career. No matter what you do in the start of your career, you know, people always remember, you hear people saying about such and such, and then they always throw in the line, uh, ah, but sure, such and such knocked them out. You know, thank God I got out of it before then. Before someone could say that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then train on the brand, and I definitely... Yeah, definitely train on the brand, yeah, and very fortunate to, to do something that you like. You know, it's great to do something that you, you love, and uh, the to have, it depends on what camps you fall into in life, doesn't it? I mean, you're in the right gyms, you know, uh, you do well, uh, you have the right tutor uh, in any trade. I mean, uh, providing you're, you, you'll put the time in yourself, you need to do that yourself. It's, it's, you don't get anything easy in life, you know. But I was fortunate enough to, to be tutored. And back then, I suppose, in the 80s, there was plenty of news happening, like, so, I mean, you didn't have to go too far looking for it. You know, it came sometimes looking for you. And yeah. uh, you were able to work through that. What was your your first big picture that you, you remember? Was it the, the Guilford Four one? <coughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the one of the strongest news pictures I probably ever got was the Guilford Four release of Jerry Conlon coming from the old Billy. I mean, <laughs> and it all falls back to boxing. You know, I, I got onto the building site to hide because they closed the place off and they let me hide on a building site. Two guys because they knew I was the wee boxer from Ireland because half the Half the workers in London at that stage would have been Irishmen building, you know, and they brought me on the building site and hid me up round one of the back of one of the walls, painting the wall, and till they were coming out, and then I went down and was able to get the the picture that I got of coming out, which was which was big, big, big picture. Who's painted the wall? Really oh, you want to see my paint? Not good, you know, not good, <laughs> not good. But uh, there, it's funny. I mean, it's it's like a circle, circle of friends, you know. You, you do make friendships and uh, people get to know you. And it's funny that everybody that sees you and watches you and follows your career, they automatically become your friend. And sometimes you don't realise that these people in their own minds have befriended you. But now with social media, that's probably accepted a lot more. Now you can defriend people and all that kind of nonsense. But back then, I mean, people sort of, there wasn't that much big sport coming to Belfast. You know, it was when you were boxing, you were so there's no Sky TV, you had two channels like, you know, so if you're on the TV, everybody's seen you. Yeah. You weren't uh, channel hopping for a hundred channels, you know, you had BBC One, and BBC Two and ITV and that was it. So nine times out of ten of you were getting coverage on television, it was seen by a big, big audience. What was it like then being in the, the other side of the camera? Like? And, uh, it's great, I mean, uh, it was great to, to have a career to move into, something that you enjoy. And I mean, I was fortunate, I mean, still fortunate that I'm still working away and still enjoying it now as much. And I still say to this day that sort of uh, what it did in the first part of my life, as I would call it, in the first chapters, still stands by what I do today because it, it helps me. It helps me get to places, it helps people seem to want to help you. And uh, it, it's like chicken and egg, it, it works hand in hand. Okay, the, the photographs and the shamrocks is probably the uh, one of the biggest uh, thorns in the, the side of the club. Uh, this is Paradise Road, uh, and to get your photograph on this wall or on this piece of wall, you have to box for Ireland. Now, you have to box for Ireland at full international. It's not, not a club side with an Irish team, it has to be the full Irish side. And uh, this would have started off more arguments within the club, boys thinking that they should be up on it. It's, it's always been kept very tight. As you go down it, you can see, well, there's, there's sets of brothers. There's obviously me and Sean, B. Russells, and then you have a set of stories of Jerry Story Jr. and Sam Story, and the dad, obviously, who who is national coach. So uh, he's entitled to go on the wall. And right down through all the areas, you've John Matthews, Jerry Hummel, uh, right down, Patrick Tenney, Tony Tunlap, you know, Trevor Kerr as you go down, Sammy Vernon, Roy Webb as you go down them, uh, it would frighten you uh, to see the talent. So that's what Tony looks like with her. That's Tony, that's Tony. So uh, it would surprise you at the talent and then through the other side everybody would be sort of uh, having different parts of the club. I suppose down the left hand corners my sanctuary would have uh, threw up stuff about me but th this part over here is when we get to the Olympic rings is what it's all about. I mean every boxer and every athlete I suppose in the world strays to compete at the Olympics. And, uh, the thing about going to the Olympics is once I always said that once you go to the Olympics it changes your life and uh, these are people that have all been fortunate enough to compete at the Olympics and as I've said earlier on I mean we're very fortunate going to the Olympics is super winning the medal at the Olympics is unbelievable and uh, it's, there's 
it's part of history and if you can do it you're blessed so we're, we're very fortunate that we have had two people within our own club that's came back with medals what about the first competition you were telling me about is that well, this is the uh, this is the power troopers this is this is before me it's prior to me now uh, i've been a kid running about listening to all the stories but you can see uh, the documentation and the, the very famous people who sort of put the power troopers in their in their own box on the same night uh it's quite People still, it gets brought up. You get guys sitting around clubs after the fights, and it still, it always reverts back. Do you remember the night we beat the Paris? So it's uh, it's a good bit of crack. Brilliant stuff. Good man. Thanks very much.